and welcome to the rental assistance demonstration component one public housing um, presentation for Illinois advocates. My name is Emily Coffey and I am a housing justice staff attorney at the Shriver Center on Poverty Law. This presentation is updated as to June 2020. So please uh, make sure that you are looking for the most up-to-date information if you are viewing this webinar after that date. What is the rental assistance demonstration? So RAD is the conversion of public housing and certain other uh, HUD subsidized affordable housing programs to either project-based vouchers or project-based rental assistance. We'll go through what each of these things mean throughout this presentation. But the reason for RAD um, in the public housing program, so RAD component one covers the public housing program, is that public housing can only be uh, maintained through you know, upgrades and maintenance of the physical conditions of a building through what's known as the capital fund. Congress has not fully funded the capital fund for decades. As a result, public housing throughout the country is in a significant state of disrepair. And each year we are losing around 10,000 units of public housing to demolition and disposition um, because Congress is not funding it at the level that is necessary. So the goal and the purpose behind RAD is to preserve and improve public housing through the conversion of project-based rental assistance or project-based vouchers. Um, and the reason why uh, it's required that there be this conversion to a different form of subsidy is that it then allows public housing authorities to use other forms of financing aside from the capital fund uh, to finance repairs. So allows access to low-income housing tax credits, mortgages, bonds, um, et cetera, um, as different forms of, um, of financing that are available. Just real quick, RAD component two, which is not the focus of this presentation, uh, focuses on the long-term affordability of certain legacy HUD assisted housing programs. So that includes the Moderate Rehabilitation Program, Rent SUP, Rental Assistance Payment, or RAP, and Section 202 uh, PRAC, Project-Based rent or Project Rental Assistance Contracts, Property Rental Assistance Contracts, uh, which uh, are affordable housing for older adults. Um, and so really the, um, the goal there is long-term affordability that also simplifies the, um, the streams and contracts that are in place for those um, older HUD legacy programs. It is essential that advocates are involved in monitoring RAD implementation in their communities. RAD includes many different tenant protections, but if tenants are not notified about what their rights are, there's a good chance that, that RAD is not gonna be implemented properly. Some of those tenant protections include, um, RAD protects against displacement, um, but if a RAD conversion is going to include the imposition of low-income housing tax credits, there is a chance that tenants are gonna be rescreened and that some tenants could be replaced. Under RAD, um, if there is going to be tenant relocation, there can be significant impacts on folks with disabilities, uh, older adults who need reasonable accommodations or modifications to their units. There can be issues for tenants who are paying flat rents or the ceiling rent, um, who have a right to a phase in rent increase. There can be civil rights or um, really practical challenges with conversion um, that uh, results in new house rules at a development. Um, at the time of conversion, um, any debt that a tenant owes is, uh, is inputted into EIV, uh, which means that it is a debt that is going to stay on the tenant's record uh, for the next 10 years and could impact their ability to move to a different affordable housing development uh, should they choose in the future. A 
GAO report from a couple of years ago really highlighted HUD's inadequate oversight over RAD conversions um, and really explained that it put tenants at risk and made it um, difficult to ensure the long-term affordability of these properties. So it's really critical that, um, that advocates are working with tenants uh, and community-based organizations on the implementation of RAD and monitoring it thereafter. The main legal authorities for RAD, uh, first, it is the RAD authorizing statute. Um, it has been reauthorized annually with some slight amendments over the years. Um, there's the RAD implementation notices. There have been four different uh, RAD notices uh, that that outline the process for RAD conversion. There is also a RAD notice on fair housing, civil rights, and relocation that, uh, that really goes through all of the obligations under the Fair Housing Act, other civil rights laws, and uh, under the Uniform Relocation Act. In addition to that, there are many documents about each individual conversion that, uh, that govern an individual transaction. So this includes the HAP contract, use agreements, um, and, other, and other relevant agreements. Again, this, uh, this presentation is focused on the uh, conversion to, of public housing units to either project-based vouchers or project-based rental assistance through RAD. But just to highlight the really main differences between the two components of RAD, because it can get um, pretty complicated, uh, component one is for public housing. Component two is for Section 202 PRAC, Mod Rehab, Mod Rehab SRO, um, Rent SUP, and RAP contracts. Component one is a very competitive, selective process where there are a lot of requirements that, uh, that housing authorities have to go through in order to be able to convert. Congress currently has a cap on the number of units that are eligible for conversion at 455,000 units. Under RAD Component 2, it is not competitive. Any owner that is applying for conversion is eligible to convert. Um, the, all of the conversions in the RAP and Rent SUP programs have already occurred. So there are no more active uh, contracts in either of those programs. In Component 1, the Housing Authority gets to decide whether to convert to project-based vouchers or project-based rental assistance. In component two, the housing authority or the, or the private owner, depending on the type of contract that it is, chooses um, to convert to PBRA or PBVs um, if, the con um, if the contract is still active. But if it was an old um, rent sup or wrap contract that had already expired, the owner didn't have a choice, they had to convert to project-based vouchers. In RAD Component 1, the housing assistance payment contract needs to be renewed indefinitely in order to ensure that the housing remains affordable in perpetuity. Under RAD Component 2, however, um, there, uh, it must just follow the previous commitments that the owner made in terms of affordability. So if there was an option under the old contract to not renew a, a future contract, the owner retains that option. And those developments need to be monitored just like all of the project-based Section 8 developments across the country where there is a risk of opt-out or non-renewal of the HAP contract. Now, there are some really key differences between project-based vouchers and project-based rental assistance. When we're talking about project-based vouchers, these are vouchers that are attached to a unit that is overseen by the Public Housing Authority and follows the rules according to the Public Housing Authority's administrative plan. Project-based rental assistance, however, is more in line with the project-based Section 8 program where a private owner essentially has a contract that is overseen by HUD's Office of Multifamily. Project-based vouchers do not have standard uh, lease terms, but they do have to follow the project-based voucher regulations and the RAD rules. So that means that, uh, that the lease must outline 
good cause eviction protection, termination notification, and the grievance procedures that are in, uh, required under RAD. Project-based rental assistance uh, leases, however, have to follow the HUD model lease, uh, and so are, are similar to the project-based Section 8 lease agreement. The housing assistance payment contract for PDVs is initially either for 15 to 20 years, and there's a requirement that the housing authority continue to renew the housing assistance payment contract. Um, very similarly in the PBRA program, the first contract must be for 20 years, um, but there is still this obligation to renew that, the HAP contract. In the PDV program, tenants have choice mobility rights, which means that after 12, 12 months after the RAD conversion is completed and the tenant signs their new lease under RAD, they have the right to receive a mobile housing choice voucher. And a mobile housing choice voucher um, is essentially the same thing as a, uh, a usual Section 8 voucher. There can be restrictions on the number of tenants that are eligible to receive a housing choice voucher this way each calendar year. Um, and that will be outlined in your housing authority's administrative plan. In the project-based rental assistance conversions, tenants still have a choice mobility rights, but they must live in the unit for two years after uh, the conversion occurs before they can receive that mobile housing choice voucher. So when there is a public housing conversion, there are many steps that a housing authority has to go through in order to convert their public housing units under RAD. First, the housing authority is evaluating whether or not RAD is, is a good option for them and, the, and you know, feasible for the long-term sustainability of their affordable housing portfolio. The housing authority will then, um, if it does decide that it is feasible, they'll submit an application to HUD. HUD will then issue what's known as a commitment to enter into a housing assistance payment contract or a CHAP. Uh, after the CHAP is issued, the housing authority has a number of things that they have to do depending on the type of conversion that they are doing. Um, so whether they are planning to move units to a different uh, development, build a brand new development, do short-term um, displacement of residents in order to um, do a significant rehab, um, or whether uh, there's going to be um, minimal change to how the tenant uh, is going to live in the short term in the public housing unit. Um, depending on what the specifics of any individual conversion looks like, the housing authority will have to submit um, various fair housing documentation, various, um, like a relocation plan if they're planning to do relocation. They'll always have to submit a financing plan that lays out the long-term uh, financial um, uh, you know, ability for the development to do interim, um, to do interim um, rehabilitation and uh, large scale renovation um, and to maintain the development for the long term. And they must submit any information about any amendments that they're making from their initial application to HUD. And there are timelines outlined in the RAD notice um, if you are interested in looking at, at when all of these steps occur in more detail. Um, currently, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, HUD is pretty liberally granting extensions on, on many of these, uh, these deadlines. Um, but there, in generally speaking, there are um, times that, that housing authorities have to complete these, uh, these various uh, requirements. And then once all of these plans are submitted and approved by HUD, HUD will issue what is known as a RAD Conversion Commitment, or RCC. Shortly thereafter, there will be a RAD closing. And after the closing occurs, um, there is ongoing monitoring that, that needs to occur to make sure that all of the resident rights are protected. 
because generally speaking, it is not until after the closing that uh, that tenants are very um, impacted by the the RAD conversion at all. So that's after the RAD closing is when they'll sign a new lease. After the RAD closing is when renovations and potential relocation will start to begin. Um, and so this is really where we then start to see a lot of the legal issues come up uh, in terms of, of tenant protections. As of June 2020, um, these are all of the housing authorities in Illinois that are currently in the process of converting under RAD that have had uh, CHAP, that's again, commitments to enter into housing assistance payment contracts awarded to them. The Chicago Housing Authority also has a number of developments that have approved financing plans in place and should be um, in process to uh, finalize the conversion, assuming um, they get the other approvals um, in, uh, in the near future. All of these housing authorities in, um, in Illinois have already closed and converted their public housing units under RAD. For a more detailed description of each of these developments, you can find out all information about um, uh, some really high level um, information about what uh, what specifically is happening at a, a development that is converting under RAD by going to HUD's website, radresource.net. This um, will give you information about the uh, where a housing authority is in the RAD process, and if they have already closed, it will include information about um, the, the ways in which they finance the conversion and whether it's a conversion to PBVs or PBRA. So one of the reasons why it's so important for advocates to understand the process for RAD is that there are many opportunities throughout a RAD conversion for tenants and advocates to um, uh, attend meetings, uh, to discuss what is, is happening with the RAD conversion and to submit written comments. Um, the first time that a tenant's gonna learn about, about RAD is most likely through the RAD information notice or the RIN. These are required to be submitted uh, to tenants um, prior to the initial RAD application. So very early on in the process. Um, at some point in the process, to uh, if there's going to be relocation, tenants will receive a GIN or a general information notice that will uh, describe, you know, that tenants uh, do not have to leave their housing right now, but it is anticipated in the future that relocation will be required and providing some very basic information about their rights under that, under that process. So after the um, RAD information notice, um, is, is provided, there will be at least two meetings with tenants and tenants have the right to submit written comments and the housing authority is required to respond to each of those, uh, to each of those comments. Um, anytime the plans are changed, there must be an additional meeting to discuss those changes to the plans. There must also be one meeting before the financing plan is submitted. And there needs to be another written notice to tenants once the RAD conversion commitment is approved. So some examples of when there are substantial changes to the RAD application or the CHAP or um, any other piece of the RAD conversion uh, where there will be an additional meeting that is required is if there's any change about the transfer of assistance. So if the housing authority is planning to um, to move certain units to somewhere else or to build a new a new development. There is a requirement that there be, you know, an additional meeting to discuss that, and also if there's significant changes to what that might look like, or if they're deciding, you know, at first they were planning to do a transfer of assistance and then they could not get the financing to make that possible. So they are 
instead not planning to transfer the assistant, they would have to have an additional meeting to discuss that. If there are uh, plans to work with an outside developer um, and you know, there needs to be a, a meeting to discuss that uh, and that should, uh, that should really be about making sure that, um, that it is clear to everybody and that the, um, the legal agreements uh, are all solid as to the long-term affordability of the development. If there is a change to the number or configuration of assisted units, there must be a meeting. If there's a reduction in the number of units, there must be a meeting. If there's a substantial change in the scope of work that is um, anticipated uh, and the scope of the rehabilitation that's gonna occur, there needs to be a meeting. And then if there's a proposed change uh, to the utilities that tenants are required, that are responsible for themselves, there must be a meeting to discuss that. Now the RAD authorizing statute um, and the HUD notices provide a lot of protections in terms of uh, protecting tenants against permanent displacement. Many RAD conversions will require some degree of renovation. This doesn't always mean that tenants will be relocated, um, but if it does mean tenants are going to be relocated or that there's significant construction happening in their units, there can be really significant challenges um, on tenants, especially um, uh, tenants with children, uh, tenants with disabilities, and older adults. The RAD Relocation Fair Housing and Civil Rights Notice um, really outlines all of the tenants' protections uh, when there is temporary displacement for the renovations or if there's new construction and the rights that tenants are entitled to um, if they are forced to relocate. The Uniform Relocation Act uh, is also triggered if there is permanent relocation um, as a result um, because there's new construction or if there's temporary relocation that is going to exceed a year. Under RAD, there is also an explicit requirement that owners and housing authorities not rescreen at the time of the RAD conversion. So a house, the ways in which this comes up, there's, there's many, um, but the most significant is if the RAD conversion uh, includes adding low-income housing tax credits, uh, there are different rules and regulations that LIHTC units, that tenants who are applying for LIHTC units have to meet that do not apply to the public housing uh, program where there are often um, fewer uh, fewer admissions um, uh, obligations. So, uh, for example, if you are a student, um, you do you are not eligible for low-income housing tax credit housing uh, under most circumstances. If you are um, over income for the low-income housing tax credit program, you can still be a public housing resident even if you're over income for that program, and you cannot be displaced. Um, simply because the developer wants to add LIHTC to the development. An owner or housing authority cannot place the LIHTC uh, unit in the unit that that tenant lives in if it would mean displacement. Um, a RAD owner may also have different screening criteria for new tenants um, in the future. Um, they might impose you know, different credit requirements, different, uh, different, you know, record screening requirements that the housing, than the housing authority did. Um, but um, under no circumstance can a tenant who was a public housing tenant uh, where the development converted under RAD, can they be subject to that rescreening? Uh, there can be a de minimis reduction in that number. There can also be a reduction in units if for at least two years 
prior to the submission of the RAD application, there were vacant, uh, some units of the development were vacant. Also, if some units could be used either more effectively or efficiently for the residents, there can be a reduction. So this could look like adding a community space. It could look like maybe there's, uh, there's a need for more family housing. So they're going to combine some units um, to, uh, to, to better serve the community that they are working with. There could be a reduction for that reason, uh, subject to HUD approval. Um, housing authorities historically under RAD have tried to get around the one for one replacement requirement by only applying for a percentage of the development to be a RAD conversion and for the remainder, those units that they did not um, want to replace uh, to apply for Section 18 demolition or disposition. Now, uh, there are, uh, there, there's much more clarity as to how that can happen. Section 18, they're, they're called Section 18 blended applications. Um, and now all of the RAD rules about rescreening, tenant protections, um, one for one replacement are, um, are generally applicable to Section 18 blended applications. When we're looking at the long-term preservation of units, um, this is a really critical component of the RAD program. So, HAPCON, so in the project-based Section 8 program, there is the ability for owners to frequently opt out or not renew their Section 8 contract once it expires. Under the RAD program, however, um, there has to be long-term preservation and there is a requirement that the HAP contract is renewed um, uh, repeatedly. And there also, if there is a sale um, of, um, so, if, so if there is um, a sale contemplated as part of the RAD conversion, there still has to be a role that the housing authority is playing uh, in terms of uh, either uh, as part of the ownership entity or a long-term ground lease that the housing authority maintains. Um, that requires the long-term preservation of the affordable housing there. And so if there is low-income housing tax credit, then it is possible that there will be a private for-profit developer that is included. If a private company owns the unit, um, then the housing authority needs to retain some ownership interest in the development. So frequently the housing authority will create a separate entity that allows them to do this or will enter into a long-term ground, ground lease. But if there is not any low-income housing tax credits, RAD units have to be owned either by a nonprofit or a public entity. There's also, there's the RAD use agreement that is tied to the land. So even if the HAP contract is terminated in the future or there's a foreclosure uh, for, um, for non-payment of a mortgage or for non-compliance with the mortgage terms, the affordability restrictions are going to survive that foreclosure or termination. One um, additional problem with the RAD program is the lack of transparency that happens when you privatize any aspect of a formerly public um, role. So it's important that advocates are encouraging their housing authorities to require reporting on resident relocation, number of tenants who choose to return or who choose not to return on uh, the you know, one for one replacement of units, on progress in terms of the construction, on the number of evictions that are being filed, on the number of work orders that are being filled um, or number of work orders that are not being filled and on the number of tenants who choose to um, get a portable section 8 voucher uh, and utilize their choice mobility rights
um, under rad tenant, so under public housing, there are many tenants who pay flat rents or ceiling rents, um, whose rent is going to go up as a result of the rad conversion. And that is because there is an increase in the baseline of the rent uh, that goes up through rad um, because of the way that the rent is calculated uh, by HUD under a rad conversion. But tenants in that circumstance will, um, whose rent is going up substantially, so either more than $25 or more than 10%, um, are required to have that rent increase phased in over either three to five years. This will be outlined in the Housing Authority's uh, administrative plan or otherwise in their agreement with the developer um, to phase in under either a three to five year increase. However, this is only for tenants that are paying the ceiling rent. Most tenants will continue to pay what they've always paid, which is 30% of their adjusted gross income uh, towards, towards the rent. In the uh, project-based rental assistance conversions, um, so when RAD closes, tenants have to sign a new lease. This is the same in both the PBRA and the PBV context. If it's a PBRA conversion, that lease is going to be the HUD model lease. The HUD model lease specifies good cause um, eviction termination procedure. It outlines grievance rights that are special in the, the um, RAD program. It should explain the maintenance procedure, any fees like late fees. It should explain the lease term. Uh, it should incorporate the tenant's right to organize and incorporate any other house rules that may be in place of the development. PDV leases, however, um, do not have a form lease that is required. Tenants will have to sign a new lease and that lease just has to include certain information um, that is required under the project-based uh, voucher regulations. So that would include good cause eviction protection and RAD uh, grievance rights procedures. Uh, in, in RAD conversions, there is um, often the um, addition of house rules that were never in place before. Uh, this is uh, a real good opportunity for tenants to get involved in negotiating the house rules um, and making sure that they are, um, that they're reasonable and that they are what um, tenants, that they are rules that tenants want to live under. Um, it's important because the house rules are part of their lease. And so if there are violations of the house rules, um, you know, as long as the, the rule meets the, the general terms of the, of the program, um, it could be potentially used as a basis for eviction. So it's important that the house rules, however, are not in conflict with other lease provisions, that the house rules are not unreasonable, that the house rules do not otherwise violate uh, any of the tenant's civil rights. Under RAD as well, there are increased tenant participation rights. So in the public housing program, tenants have organizing rights under uh, part six, 964 of the HUD regulations. But under RAD, the tenant organization uh, rules change. There may be circumstances where existing tenant organizations continue uh, but there should be some additional flexibilities and protections uh, that the, the tenant organizations have should they um, choose to um, increase their flexibility. In the PBRA conversion, the project-based rental assistance conversion, this will follow the tenant organizing protections that are outlined in uh, part 245 subpart B of the, of the CFR. Um, so this requires that Tenant organizations are groups that meet regularly, groups that operate democratically, groups that represent the interests of all tenants of the development, not just the contingent, and that they are completely independent of ownership and management. 
under PBV conversions, HUD has not said that the um, Part 245 regulations apply um, precisely, but the notice does essentially limit or um, mirror these regulations. Public housing tenant associations are also generally required to have written bylaws, but RAD tenant organizations are not required to. It may still be a best practice and encouraged to have written bylaws. Tenant organizations also um, under the public housing program receive um, funding that is equal to $15 per occupied unit per year to fund tenant participation activities. And this continues under RAD. Um, the, the main difference is that there might not be a written agreement that's required between the housing authority or owner, um, but it's still, I think, a best practice to, to have that written agreement in place. All RAD, RAD units also retain grievance rights. And that's important because this is one of the best tenant protections that residents have in the public housing program. RAD even improves on these protections and right to grievance. Um, so tenants have the right to a written notice of any adverse action that is, uh, that's against them, including a copy of the evidence that supports that adverse action, it includes the right to an informal hearing with an impartial member of the owner's staff. So not, you know, not somebody who is not, uh, not somebody who is directly involved in the adverse decision. It includes a right to a formal grievance hearing. It includes a right to legal representation at the informal hearing as well as the formal hearing. It includes the right to a written decision that needs to be provided within a reasonable period of time and it requires a written notice to inform residents of these rights. As I've said before, um, tenants are entitled to choice mobility rights under both um, the PBV and the PBRA conversion. PBV conversions, it's after one year that tenants are entitled to uh, choice mobility rights, which is um, the ability to get a portable housing choice voucher or two years in the, under the project-based rental assistance uh, program. So this means that the tenant will be next in line for the next set of vouchers. There can be limits on the number of tenants who will get these vouchers any calendar year. Um, and so it's important, like once a tenant uh, can apply to get to be next on the list uh, for these vouchers that they do so if they are planning on moving anytime soon. Generally speaking, it is best to get involved in RAD as early as possible. Before an application submitted is submitted is really the time when you can maximize tenant consultation and involvement, but it's never too late. Even if there's already been a closing of a RAD deal, uh, there's a whole lot that, uh, that needs to be monitored to make sure that tenants' rights are being protected. Generally speaking, um, while HUD has improved on the number of meetings that are required throughout the RAD conversion process, it's critical that advocates are providing separate space and know your rights presentations to ensure that tenants understand their rights in the long term and so that you can learn where things might have gone wrong. Advocates can also work with tenants to negotiate memorandums of understanding with the housing authority or the future owner uh, to maximize tenant consultation and ensure that the process runs smoothly for everyone. Now, if you have questions about RAD, we are eager to learn from you and to work with you to partner um, on your local RAD conversions to make sure that everything is being implemented in the tenant's best interest. If you need additional information, it is not everything, so you will probably still need to submit 
Freedom of Information Act request to get more information um, or request that from your local housing authority. Um, but it does provide a baseline for, of information. There are also some resident focused fact sheets that HUD put out a number of years ago. And the National Housing Law Project has a lot of information about RAD that is, um, is very critical reading as you get involved with RAD. If you have questions or would like to partner on any RAD conversion happening in your community, please get in touch. Again, my name is Emily Coffey. I am a housing justice staff attorney at the Shriver Center on Poverty Law, and here is my contact information. Thank you so much.